and we're live. All right. Hello, everyone. Hey, everybody. Really excited for today's session. Uh, really looking forward to having the time with everyone. Um, this is Keith again from Spring. And uh, to prove that I am Keith from Spring, I wore my Spring t-shirt. <laughs> so you guys know who I am. Um, and yeah, so really looking forward to this time we're going to spend together. And uh, and today, uh, really excited to be joined by Luann. Um, Lu Luann, why don't you say hi? Hi, everyone. Very excited to be here. And I'm, unfortunately, I'm not wearing my spring, but I am wearing a suit jacket. So I dress up nice and fancy for all of us today. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It's good to see that some people have uh, real adult clothes uh, during uh, the lockdown, which is great. Um, yeah. yeah, so excited to have all of you here. We're, we're What we're gonna do is we're just gonna take a few minutes to allow everybody to get settled in and uh, and join us. Uh, so we have a bunch of people that are online already. And uh, so we'll just wait a few more minutes. Um, just, you know, for those who've been on prior sessions, you guys know about the ask a question button below, but uh, for those who are new uh, to, um, to Crowdcast, there is this ask a question uh, uh, button down below, and that's a place for you to ask any and all questions that you may have. Um, and today we're going to talk about rebooting our plan and actually turning this crisis into an opportunity for our companies. And, and so we're really excited about having this conversation today. And uh, if you have any comments, of course, you can just put those in the chat. And uh, we're really looking forward. So as you get a chance, please do introduce yourself um, in chat. Uh, so just dive in and say hi. That'd be fantastic. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Name, ahead. name, company, maybe where you're from, just so we can get an understanding of who's in the room. That'd be awesome to find out what companies and industries you're all in. So. Yeah. 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 That's great. Thank you. Um, yeah. So good. So we'll we'll just take a minute or two more before uh, we wait for the last of the people to come online. Um, yeah, so hope uh, things are going well for all of you. Starting to hear uh, the first beginnings of good news around the world. Um, Vietnam started to loosen up their lockdown last Thursday. And then on Sunday, Spain uh, started to let kids back outside. Um, and so it's good to see, um, you know, these different points of, of data that tell us that, um, that the lockdown has a time limit um, and there's an opportunity for things to, uh, you know, and, and honestly, I was about to say get back to normal, but I actually hope that's not true. I hope things get to a place that were better than before and it's a new normal. And so, um, yeah, it's, a, it's an exciting time for us, I think, as entrepreneurs to, to go through this. Um, and so uh, a couple of things that I would say, one is, um, you know, really excited to go through this particular session. It's something that I have been through myself a couple of times. Uh, the first time that I went through uh, rebooting a plan during a recession, probably didn't even know we were doing it. Um, you know, it was just something that was almost instinct, right? And so we were going through this exercise of trying to, to find, you know, viability and to find survival uh, as a company. And so, um, I think the second time that I went through, we had a much greater awareness of what we were trying to do. And, and, uh, and so, yeah, each subsequent time, the actual process of rebooting your plan gets easier. And, and so, so the benefit for all of us is we actually get to dive in now. I know many of you, it will be your first, um, recession that you're going through. And so, uh, you know, we hope that we can make this process faster and more efficient, uh, for you. Um, and just as an aside, um, I'm actually using my phone right now uh, because when I uh, turned my laptop on this morning, it decided to uh, install the new version of the operating system. And so apparently I still have four minutes left um, in the uh, configuration and then whatever process of logging in and doing all that fun stuff. So probably in about 10 minutes time, I will switch from my phone back to my laptop, um, which will make it easier for me to engage in chat um, and a few other features. But why don't we why don't we get started? 
Um, and um, I'm going to uh, just take a moment to introduce myself, then I'll get uh, Luann to do the same. Um, we'll chat just briefly about spring, and then what we'll do is we'll dive into the content. Again, uh, feel free to make any comments and chat. Love to have you introduce yourself in there. Um, so your name, what company you're with, um, and, uh, and then lastly, uh, where you're from. And then if you have any questions, just pop those into ask a question and uh, we'd love to um, answer any and all questions you have about the crisis, about the recession, rebooting your plan, growing sales, you name it, we'll talk about it. Um, so my name is Keith Ippel and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Spring. And so really excited to share this time with you today. Um, I am a serial entrepreneur. Spring is my fourth venture. It's also my fourth recession in business my third is a leader and uh and so it's a you know it's an opportunity for me to share and give back of my experience um and my lessons learned uh so really excited to be able to do that and uh, i'm based in vancouver canada i've had the good fortune of being in albania um a few times actually over the last about two years um including um last april and last october in 2019 and so yeah so just really excited to be able to spend this time with you all and over to Lewin. hi everyone nice to meet all of you um welcome a uh, couple people just coming into the chat here um well i was very excited to be in albania just we were supposed to go this past march but because of all the covid related things we weren't able to go do that but uh a trip is hopefully scheduled in the fall so i would be I would love to meet all of you in person at one point. Um, my name is Luan Tolosa, and I'm a program manager and facilitator here at Spring Activator. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, after getting my bachelor's of commerce, I ended up working in corporate in the commercial real estate industry for just under a decade before deciding that I needed a change. So I decided to get my MBA at Queen's University here out in Ontario, kind of close to where Erkins is stranded right now, um, thinking that I would continue in corporate but actually ended up pivoting into entrepreneurship and becoming very impact curious. And that's kind of how I fell into Spring's little network here. Um, from there, I launched two businesses, one consulting for SMEs and entrepreneurs on operations and strategy. And then the other, I started Suit, which is a women's direct to consumer clothing brand, which operates by e-commerce and in person, which I continue to do today out of Vancouver. And now with Spring, I get to use my technical knowledge and entrepreneurial background to help others like yourselves to make the world a better place. So I'm excited to chat with all of you today. Great. Thanks for uh, that introduction, Luann. Uh, so everybody, what we're going to do is we're going to share a presentation. Um, and today's presentation is really designed to be a guide uh, to this discussion. Uh, we are hoping that uh, you will bring your questions and your um, comments. Um, as we go through. So really looking forward to that. Um, and maybe as a starting point, um, I would say that um, several of you have been on the past webinars, uh, a couple of you may be new, um, but a question that I have for you, and if you guys want to respond in chat is, how many of you have actually rebuilt your plan in the last six weeks? Um, so that would be a question that I would ask if you can put your answer in the chat um, as to whether or not you've actually uh, rebuilt your plan. I'd love to hear that comment. Um, but Luann, why don't you uh, go ahead and share the presentation and we'll dive in uh, while people are answering that. Yeah, so I would love to, except for the fact that uh, share my screen has disappeared from my screen right now. So I'm going <laughs> to pause this for a second. Um, I might have to refresh my screen. So Keith, I'm gonna just take 30 seconds to refresh my screen because my share screen has disappeared. So I'll be right back. Yeah, that sounds good. So while Luann is uh, rebooting your screen, I feel like I should be doing a song and a dance for everybody. Um, any recommendations for karaoke that I should be doing right now while uh, Luann is trying to reboot back into the system? Uh -huh. Hi, hey, and there she is. You saved me. I was just offering to do karaoke for everyone. So well, I saved everyone from that. We've heard that before. We don't need to go and do that. <laughs> Perfect. Right. right. Yeah. There you go. If anyone can't see my screen, just maybe pop it into the chat. But I think for Keith and I, I think we both can see it. So cool. 
So yeah, so uh, welcome everybody. Um, yeah, really uh, uh, exciting to um, to talk about building a new plan, and and I'm hoping to share as much wisdom as I possibly can uh, to uh, to all of you about my own experiences in building and rebooting plans. And Luann, as a, as an entrepreneur, obviously being able to talk about how she has pivoted in her plans um, uh, with Suit. And so I'm really looking forward to having her share that. Um, so if we go to the next slide, Luann, um, first thing first, uh, I acknowledge you for innovation, um, for being such a great partner for us. Um, and yeah, just really glad that uh, we're, able, we're able to uh, do that. Um, so thanks uh, everyone for uh, for allowing uh, you to be a part of this and, and for um, enabling us to do it. So, um, so for our agenda today, um, just to cover that off on the next slide, you know, we're just going to talk briefly about why we build a new plan, uh, what goes into it. Um, we'll talk about customers first, uh, the customer plan, and then we'll dive into next steps. So, uh, yeah, so that's kind of the, the goal that we'll go through right now, which I'm really looking forward to. Anita, and so, oh, sorry, I was just going to say, Anita really wants you to do the karaoke offer. So maybe let's add that to the end of. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what a terrifying thought. Um, <laughs> yeah, for all of you, by the way, I mean, hey, I'll sing anytime, but, you know, let's let's be real. Um, cool. OK, so uh, you've met uh, both myself and Luann and. Um, this gives you a bit of an example of uh, some of the work that Suit uh, has been doing and does, and so this will be one of the uh, one of the examples that we draw on um, over the course of this session. So really looking forward to that. Um, so if we move on, um, why I build a new plan, and so what I'd love to hear from everybody in chat is, you know, we we asked that question earlier about have you been building a new plan, but I'd also love to hear any comments that you may have about, you know, why we should be building a new plan, right? Um, so I'd love to do that. So uh, we, have, we have a great comment from Eglantina. I hope I'm getting your, your name right. Um, she says that she's an MBA candidate in international management from ESCP, a business school in Paris, and graduating in the middle of all of this in July 2020. So she's planning to build her company in the nearest future or find a better place. So I guess that kind of ties into all of this as well because her coming out of school in the middle of what will probably still be our our recession um i think are there any thoughts keith on on suggestions about timing with that especially now that we're talking about building new plans and pivoting so that question is about when to launch is that the question yeah well she's planning to build her company in the near future or maybe is, is now a good time or right after school or is that something that can happen later on? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I, I personally think that a couple of things that you want to think about as you think about launching a business um, in or the chance of launching a business during a recession, uh, one, of course, is the amount of capital you have. So if you look at your financial forecast, do you have enough capital to actually make this thing happen? I think that's kind of question number one for me. Um, because what you want to do is you want to make sure that you have enough runway to be able to get launched and uh, to be able to hit the milestones you want to hit. And then the second one, of course, is that you want to be able to uh, know that you are uh, ideally able to get to revenue quickly. So without knowing your idea, I do think that that's an important question that to answer is, can you get to revenue in, in a time frame that actually matches your runway? Um, so 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 those are the two key considerations that i think people need to to decide on and therefore you need to decide on as you're going through this process um in general i actually think that launching a business in a recession is actually a really good time if you're solving a need for a marketplace um and either if that need is consistent through a recession or if it's amplified during a recession i think it's a great time um I actually launched a business uh, actually about six months before the 08 uh, recession started. And we actually ended up doing incredibly well during the recession. But part of that was knowing that we had the runway. Part of it was knowing we could get to revenue quickly. And we also did adapt 
very quickly in that recession uh, to make sure that we could get to revenue faster. So, so my encouragement to you is look at your runway. My encouragement to you is, is look at your customer set and, and, and determine how quickly you can get to revenue so that you can survive through this process. And if the answer to those two questions is yes, then I think the answer can be, yeah, absolutely, you could, you could launch. So, so I'm going to pause there. Um, and what I'm actually going to do is now I'm going to drop off because miracle of miracles, my laptop is, has completed its upgrade. Um, and so Luann, what I'll do is I'll allow you to start to segue into the next slide or any comments that have been happening um, in the chat. Um, and I should be back on in 90 seconds or less. Okay. So I'll see you guys shortly. <laughs> so should I start karaoke now? Because uh, Keith has come off. I might be slightly better than him. Um, so while Keith is going and rebooting his uh, his computer there, some great comments um, that have been popping up in the chat in terms of planning, planning is strategic, avoid stress, capital. Uh, Keith, who I may wish to share with some of the new joiners the idea of the runway. Perfect. Um, thank you, Anita, for, for mentioning that. So in the last session, what we covered was talking about runway. And so what Keith means about runway is is that Keith? that might be Keith in the background as well. So what Keith means about runway is how much time do you have left in terms of cash in the bank? And so that typically means that um, how much cash you have in the bank with divided by how many months you have left in terms of expenses and overhead. And Keith is back. Sorry, one sec. I'm just gonna invite him back in the screen. That was very quick. Did I continue? Um, so that's what me, uh, Keith means about runway. How much cash you have left in the bank divided by how many months of runway and operation, operate on, operating costs you have left. And so from that, um, we were talking about how, uh, sorry folks, Keith is, perfect. okay. So let's get Keith accepted and connected. So maybe his wife is taking a second here. But uh, yeah, thank you, Anita. Yes, for the new people that are in the room, that's what Runway is about. Um, so in terms of our previous sessions as well, if you're curious, the webinar recordings are in the Crowdcast link, which I can provide before the session. So if you want a refresher, we can definitely talk about that. Um, Eglantina, I really hope I'm getting your name right. Uh, one of the interesting things that I was hoping to talk about today as well is actually I launched Suit um, from my MBA as well, just after I graduated. So a lot of the strategic planning that we were going to talk about um, had a lot to do with the knowledge that I've learned through my MBA. So there's a lot of kind of synergies and hopefully learnings that I can provide then. Um, sorry, Keith is... Sorry. Keith was in and then he's out and he's in again. So let's just continue on. Okay, so while Keith's trying to figure out whether he's on the phone, or on the laptop, <laughs> perfect, great. So let's kind of talk about what we're gonna be talking about today. So why? So why are we going through a strategic plan right now? And like everyone knows in this room, it's because everything has essentially changed. The COVID, the lockdown, our financial situation. Now, as everyone knows, cash is very much king and understanding what our customers need. And so revenue is gonna be very important right now, especially with the fact that, you know, people are gonna be a lot, um, a lot more decisive and a lot more um, concerned about how they go and spend their money. He's accepting and connecting. He keeps popping up on my screen. So I'm not sure what's going on. So it keeps interrupting the screen. Cross fingers. Otherwise, I'm going to just start singing right now because. <laughs> okay. Let's keep going. All right. So. Let's move on to the next slide while uh, he's trying to figure out what's it. So what goes into it? So what goes into your new plan? So as Keith was talking about earlier, we were talking about runway. How much cash do we actually have and how much does this change focus? 
And the reason why is that we don't have unlimited cash to go and pivot and change. And like everyone else, that everyone in this room knows in terms of starting a new business, cash is very much limited and you have to kind of decide what, um, what you put your money into first and what is your priority. And so that's very much applicable to now in terms of a pivot. So how I like to see where we are today in terms of pivoting, it's very much like starting a new business or starting a new launch because you have to go back to the entire process of customer discovery, understanding what your customers need today, understanding how their, their purchasing habits and their thoughts and their approaches have changed since all of the, uh, the craziness of COVID has happened. And so that's very much like starting a new business uh, from scratch. You don't know and you're entering into a market that is completely foreign and unknown. Um, and it's, it's very similar to what we're going through. As much as you have your strategy and your customers right now, that's very much a different kind of customer that you're gonna be servicing for the next 12 to 18 months because of the fact that we are potentially get, we are, we are entering into a recession, which means there's a lot of different, um, we are entering into a recession. So that means that there's a lot of different kind of purchasing power and behavior that customers will go through. Keith, you're back. I was gonna start karaoke. I was ready that far in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ready. yeah. Power of technology, everybody, right there in action. Yeah. Cool. Um, so what we were kind of just in the middle about, we were just talking about runway. Um uh Egla, Eglantina just asked, or Anita, sorry, Anita mentioned about um talking about our runway from our last session and what that was. So I've kind of explained that. And then we started talking about getting into the strategic plan and why you need it uh, right now. So great. Yeah. Good. Good. All right. So um, continuing on with like, my thought, I guess. Um, so, you know, the first step of our strategic plan and what we kind of need to get into is, is the fact that you're treating this as your moment of relaunching. And it's, it's all about customer discovery, understanding what your customers need especially in the next 12 to 18 months. So Keith, I'll, I'll let you uh, take them back from there. Yeah, I think you've uh, you've really touched on it quite well. Um, and, and we chatted a little bit about this actually in that earlier question about um, graduating. Um, and, uh, and so I think, uh, you know, graduating from the program and then launching your business in a recession, recession is, is just such a critical part of that. Um, and and the runway and making sure that it lines up is is so important so yeah great um so yeah so now we're going to do a poll and uh the poll that i wanted to share um and let me just quickly pull that up so we're actually going to use this oh um you're actually the admin yeah. luann so you have the poll at the bottom so if you can actually uh, share that up. That'd be amazing. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I can type in the questions while you read them. Yeah. So that, of course, requires me to pull it up um, in a separate doc. So apologies, everybody. This whole uh, laptop rebuild thing has uh, been a bit of a bit of a journey for me today. Um, okay. So my question. Uh, th so this will go into the poll. Is how many customers? have you talked to in the last month um and in the poll um we're going to give you a couple of choices so under how many customers you have talked to in the last month uh, the first option is zero uh, the second is one to ten uh the third one is 10 to 20 and then the fourth one is 20 or more so luann if you just let me know if you need any of those Repeated? Nope. Um, yep. Poll is up and running. Great. So you guys should be able to see at the bottom of your screen, there's a poll button there. And uh, so we already have some votes coming. Great. So we have a few coming up. We have uh, starting to see a nice split amongst people. Um, so ten, 1 to 10, uh, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, that's great. Um, no one has said zero yet. Um, this is not a criticism. There is no judgment at all. 
Um, if you didn't talk to anyone, it is okay. Uh, but we just wanted to uh, make sure that we um, gave everybody a bit of a sense. And so, so as a part of this process, uh, the reason we're sharing this, of course, is because uh, we want to get a sense as to what is happening in our customer set. Um, and yeah, Jerry, yeah, uh, we cannot have zero. We do our best. Well done. Um, so Anita, thanks for asking. I would actually suggest existing and potential combined. Um, I think it's a great way to, to view this question. Um, because, because for some of us, we're not only able to talk to our existing customers, but there is an opportunity to, uh, to see both. Um, Anita, you would want to make a difference, especially the more that you talk to, right? Um, and also a second reason is when those potential customers are in a very different segment, either different demographics, or maybe they're in a different industry if you're a business to business customer uh, based company. And so th those would be a couple things that I would keep in mind. Um, yeah, and good for you. If it's much higher than 20, great. Um, and so I think when you're looking at the results of those conversations, you will want to separate them. Um, and so it gives us a pretty good sense as to what's happening. Um, and so that's a, that's a great starting point. So now I'm going to ask the question. I'm, we're actually going to do a second poll right now. And so, uh, Luann, the poll that we want to ask everyone is, what have you learned from those conversations? So what have you learned is the question. And the, the alternatives are that nothing has changed. Um, the second one that I would say is, um, you know, they won't buy. So in other words, like we have a problem because they won't buy. So option number one was nothing has changed. Option number two is they won't buy. Number three is how can they get my product? And so so that's kind of an interesting one where they, they do want to buy, but maybe they can't. Um, so nothing has changed. They won't buy it. They can't. And then the last one is, I have new customers. So in other words, you have found new segments or new opportunities. And so those would be the four topics that you can choose from in this survey. And Luann, just let me know if you need any of those um, back at you. Nothing has changed, won't buy, can't get our product and new customers. Correct, yeah. All right, so uh, ready to go. Great, new poll is up. And I'm just gonna, change the slide because Leonardo DiCaprio, as much as I love him, it's a lot of movement. <laughs> a lot of movement going on. Yeah, no worries, no worries. Yeah, so we, we're starting to get some results in. Uh, we've got three for won't buy. Um, we have one for uh, new customers, uh, one for nothing has changed. Some of the old ones did not want to buy, so I found new customers. So, uh, I don't know if I pronounce your name Rita or Rieta. Um, so um, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Um, but uh, the the um, your example is a really, really great example. Um, and that is an example of, you know, people, existing customers won't buy, so I have to go find new customers. Um, and yeah, I think that's such a great example. Um, because in our case, uh, what we need to do is we need to really find ways to get our customers going. So the example that I have locally in Vancouver right now is Portable Electric. And Portable Electric was selling portable energy units um, to the film industry. The film industry has stopped, of course, uh, because of the lockdown. Um, and so what has happened is um, they have had to find new customers. And in their case, they actually found new customers in the um, temporary um, shelter, temporary hospital market um, in response to COVID-19. So it's a good example of somebody who shifted their, um, their focus in the short term. Um, so these are really, really good examples. Um, and you guys can see that there's a diversity of 
of answers here. And so what I would love to do is actually start off with the people who answered won't buy. And maybe if you can, so uh, Reta, if, and I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, it's, and so um, you made a good example of your existing customers won't buy, so you found new customers. For the other four, for the other three of you, um, what are you currently doing to try and find, um, yeah, what are you currently doing to try and find uh, new customers? Um, and maybe we can just, Luann and I can give you a little bit of brainstorming feedback on um, on how you can try and find new customers if your current customers won't buy. So if any of the four of you want to just share um, in chat. Um, and the other thing is that I believe, Luann, you can invite people in if they want to share. Yeah. So does anybody want to share about the struggle of, customers won't buy and how do we get new customers and maybe we'll just wait a minute if somebody wants to share it's okay if you don't but this is an opportunity for you to get feedback and suggestions and support so we'd love to do that if we can yeah yeah so selling insurance and in this period everything is closed physically everything is closed um, and so that's a really uh, good one. Um, Errold, and I hope I'm saying that correctly, um, are you selling business insurance or personal insurance? Oh, business insurance? Yeah, so, um, so that's a really, really good example. Um, and uh, Rayada is willing to share as well, or re um, and so I think that that's great. Um, on the business uh, car liability, yeah. So, interesting. Um, I just want to jump in with this because I had a very interesting experience last week. So my car insurance expired, and here in Vancouver, I don't, I'm not too sure where you are. That might be different, but in Vancouver, we weren't allowed to renew insurance online. We had to do it in person at what we call ICBC here. It's a provincial body that does all auto insurance, and so before this. Uh, all the COVID shutdowns happened, we had to go in person to do the renewals. It was never online. But because of this, my insurance guy has now been able to drop off the insurance in front of my house, re review or sorry, renew online with just me accepting all those documents and never having to meet him. So it's interesting that you're having trouble over there because, you know, ICBC is a huge government body in, in uh, Columbia here that has always said no to online or anything to do with that. Everyone had to always go in person. But because of this, I have now my insurance guy coming to my front door, leaving my insurance uh, on my on my porch, essentially, and then um, doing all the kind of paperwork by email. So it's kind of forced this entire huge uh, provincial body to go and actually pivot. So it'd be interesting to hear um, why, uh, Earl, Earl? <laughs> why, uh, why uh, your insurance I guess industry isn't allowing you to do something similar. I don't know if you can kind of comment and maybe give us some context as to why. Yeah, so so Jerry has been uh, uh, typing in here uh, once per year, it's compulsory. So I actually want to share a very similar experience uh, to Luann. So um, the booking does online, but uh, the government has dis decided to close the movement. So the government is not accepting insurance mm -hmm. is, is, is what I'm hearing. So, so Errol, it sounds like they are, um, they won't like, you can fill out the paperwork Errol with the customer, but you can't actually give it to the government for the, for the actual completion of the process. And so if that is true, Errol, then what I would say, so so I actually had a similar example last week. Uh, it was actually 10 days ago. Um, and so so in the case of um, in the case of our situation, very similar to um, Luann, our insurance agent, uh, put the paperwork in front of our front door and then we went out and signed it and then they came back and they picked it up. Um, so 
Yeah, so Errol needs special permission to move with the car. So what I would recommend, and so I'm now I'm 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 just giving advice um and and open and so Luann can share and if other people have advice for Errol, do you put it in the chat as well? But Errol, do you have a list of customers? And you know those customers by renewal date. And so what I would encourage you to do is I would encourage you to create a schedule where what you do is you actually remind everyone of whose insurance is expiring and tell them the process that you will use when you are allowed to use your car again. So what I would, what I would do is I would create communication with your customers to say, um, okay, everyone, your insurance is expiring. Now, when the lockdown is lifted, here's what I will do for you to ensure that your insurance is renewed immediately so you can drive again when you are allowed to. Here are the steps that I will go through. Um, and then what you want to do is remind everyone. So yes, you cannot sell right now, but what you can do is you can remind everyone um, the, the actual sequence of steps that you will go through. Um, and, and so, and then you're saying here, I'm updating a database and improving that and sending to them the news from the government. Yeah. So good. And what you want to do is give them a checklist. So, so my encouragement to you is say, don't forget that when the lockdown is lifted, here's the steps that you need to go through. And you could actually go beyond insurance. So you could say, you know, m check your gas level, make sure your tires are filled up. Here's how we will make insurance happen. So I think those are really good examples of how you can actually make sure that the day that everybody, that the lockdown is lifted, that everybody knows the first thing they need to do, Errol, is call you. And then they'll go through the checklist. Um, and then the important part is when you go through that process, because you will be the one insurance agent who will be most prepared. So on that first day, you're gonna reach out to everyone saying, check your tires, check your gas. Here's how you fill out your insurance forms. What I would suggest is that when you give them the insurance forms, make sure that you give them some kind of an offer that says, thank you for renewing with me. Do you know one of your neighbors who also needs to renew their insurance? Can you make an introduction? So use this as an opportunity, not only to help your existing customers, but to remind them at the end of that process to introduce you to their friends so a referral system, right? And so our goal is while there is less revenue now, we will actually increase our revenue coming up because all of your customers will tell their friends that you provided the best service and, and awareness and education during the lockdown, right? So I think that that would be something I would encourage. Now, um, Luann, we, we had some great commentary in here from some other people. So Erkins mentioned, I saw co-working spots. Only three members have come back. The rest are still scared. Um, and I think there's yeah. a there's a tie-in into the last comments. And I think this is kind of just overall general comment. Um, communication and compassion to your customers has been very much key. And, and anyone, personally, if anyone has reached out to me as a consumer and is, has expressed some sort of compassion or just understanding that we're still there, that's the first step of communication. And I think Erkins, um, we actually operate out of a co-working spot um, at Spring here. And one of the things that they have done um, has been constant update of emails um, in terms of communication, in terms of telling us what's going on with the co-working space. So for example, there have been kind of a couple offerings of when you come back, these are the opportunities that are available in terms of um, creating a community, creating a network, um, there have been discounts, for example, for people that um, currently are still in the co-working space. So there's a discount for people that, um, and I, I forgot what the, uh, the structure was, for the people that can pay full amount, here's an offering. For the people that are willing to stay in the co-working space but can't afford the co-working space, they've offered a discount, I believe, of 25% of or something like that. And then the third tier is that um, if you absolutely can't pay, Here's another level of discount, but when we're up and running fully again, mm -hmm. can you 
you know, pay more than. So they've been they've been very flexible in terms of their structured tier pricing for their co-working. Um, what they've also been really great at is Slack communication. So every Thursday, Friday, they'll send a Slack message to all 300 members of their co-working space just to remind them that they're there and available. And if they want to chat, if you want to have a virtual coffee or a happy hour. So it, it's just keeping that communication up, understanding and letting them show compassion that they understand what you're going through. And here's how we can work together and get creative about it. So not necessarily, hey, here's your, here's your membership. Um, if you can't pay it, we have to cancel it. It's more of how can we help you stay in this space for the long term? Um, so I don't, I don't know if you have any additional questions. Or no, I think that that was a really good example. And Erkins, um, and for everyone, I just want to make a similar offer. But Erkins, while um, Luann was sharing that example, I actually went into my inbox and found that email from our co-working space and I forwarded it to you. So you can see the structure of how they communicated to their members. Um, and so I think it's really good for people to share examples. Now, uh, Eglantina, and I hope I'm saying that right, um, you made a couple of great, great suggestions for Errold and also for Erkins. Um, Errold, I think this is really a, a great, great opportunity for you to use new technology around newsletters, around automating systems, um, and uh, and and finding other ways to support your uh, customers. Um, and so, so yeah, I think it's just a really, really good example. Um, I would uh, I would kind of jump in there with the automation, making sure that the message is also personalized, um, yeah. making sure that it's not potentially tone deaf. Because I have had emails from you know some companies that they just are on a schedule with their marketing and they just blast it out because it's May 14 or April 30th but they don't go and review the message that's being sent. So I would say that if you are automating your message, also take a look at it, making sure that it's very customized and personalized so that way it doesn't come off as insensitive or tone deaf. I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, um, and I'm just highlighting that. Um, so Anita, you asked the question, can you please share with others as well? So that email, uh, template that I forwarded to Erkin. So maybe Erkin, you and I, after this uh, webinar, we can just make sure that everyone who is signed on for this can get a copy of that. That would be fantastic. So Anita, thanks for asking. We will definitely do that. Um, one thing that I will tell you is that for every company, because every company responded, right? Because we had to as a co-working space, they're like, do you need a discount? If so, how much? when everyone responded they actually sent a personalized thank you um to each company um and so again like just making sure that we're, we're making those thank you comments as well which i think is really really good um now um Olsi, um i operate an fmcg company in albania and the demand for some products has decreased due to covid 19. So this influence, this uh, situation is influenced sales. Um, and so Olsi, there's a couple of things that I think about um, from my perspective, and I'm definitely going to share this with uh, like, and open it up to Luann because Luann's company suit is in a similar place. One thing, and, and I think sometimes the first thing to think about is your existing customers have a market, right? And so those people need stuff. They need certain things and they need certain things during the lockdown. And so my first question to you, Olsi, is if they can't buy certain products right now, what are products that are around those that they, that they either do need or they can afford, right? And so... So those I think are really, really important questions um, to ask first is don't try and force the product on them. What you want to do is find out, um, is it because of now they can't afford it or is it because they feel like it is a luxury that they don't need? And so what I'll do is I'll hand it over to Luann. Luann can talk a bit about her experience with Suit um, and how she's responding as well. Yeah, um, so I guess a little bit of background. I don't know if I mentioned it. So Suit is a woman's custom suiting uh, brand. So a direct to consumer, in person. Um, so our obviously with the in-person appointments that has gone away now because of, of the lockdown, 
Um, so we've had a twofold approach of how we've uh, kind of rejigged pivot. So the first approach being first speaking with customers, with Keith, with, which Keith has uh, just mentioned, and then the second being speaking with our manufacturers. So our first step in all of this was going and emailing every single customer individually, anyone that's purchased a suit in the last year, um, anyone that's been very engaged with us, either online, email, social media, understanding what um, they're going through. And, and the reason why is because our vision is to be part of the stories that women inspire us, which is above and beyond clothing. So having a really strong why and a really strong vision of your, your company and your brand can help you guide um, how you approach. So with us emailing every single customer that we speak to, it's more of a question of how, what are you going through? How can we help? Um, what is it that is pressing you in this moment in time? And you know, we're a premium price brand. We're about, we're over eight hundred dollars Canadian, which um, you know, aside from sitting at home, we're all not dressing up for work anymore either. So the question was, what do they need? And so what we found in terms of customer discovery is that a lot of them need help with their business. Uh, or they just got laid off and so need career advice and they need to pivot or they just need an ear to talk to. Um, and some of them, they still want to purchase a suit, but it's a matter of when. They all want to get back to their jobs, but they don't need it right now. Um, so we've been kind of making sure that we're front in mind and center, just like what Keith was talking about insurance. Once everything is lifted and once everything goes back to a new normal, you want to be top of mind when they're going and thinking about insurance or clothing or, or whatever it is that they need once they start purchasing again. So that's been our first approach. And then the second approach is being very open and honest with our supplier about what's going on here locally. And the reason why is because they're the ones that can help you get through this as well because they're your supply chain. And for us, because we're a product, um, it was very much a conversation about how can we get to the other side of this with our supplier's help. So that, you know, with new product offerings, We've been talking to them about how we can pivot into newer product offerings that are maybe um, lower cost of goods, for example. So because our suits are so expensive, is there a secondary product offering that can help complement the customers that we have? And, you know, what's come out of this has really been a very interesting mix of people that still want to buy suits. That are, you know, they're still the premium price. Then we have other people that want to buy suits at a lower price, which is a new um, customer altogether. And then another thing that has come about have been masterminds and coaching, actually, because a lot of women now still want to, you know, figure out what to do with their careers because of everything that's going on with COVID. So we now have started something a little informal, but it's it's a mastermind group where women can kind of talk and chat about what's going on. And so that might eventually evolve into another um, line of revenue because that could be something that we could charge, maybe not right now, but maybe in the future if it becomes uh, enough traction. So. In these conversations, in these emails, almost three different kind of products have come about, which has been super exciting. Um, obviously, a lot of work, but I think you know that this goes back to going and speaking to your customers first, understanding where they are, and then figuring out how you, as a company, can help solve that problem for them. So, um, long-winded answer, but but there you go. <laughs> yeah, you know, fantastic comments, um, Luann, I just put in. I tried to capture all three, but I captured two of them, I think. So if you can pop in the third one, just make sure that I've got them right. Um, but one thing that I want to highlight on that one um, is that um, we will definitely be talking about this process of like, how do we listen to the customer to note what it is that they are, um, you know, what they are looking for um at this time and how we can adapt um and so we do have this comment it says my problem will be that i'll have all the requests oh so this is from Errol. when albania will open up i'm trying to offer special offers to customers who want to renew the policies now and so Errol, here's my Here's my suggestion is um, you need to think, I, I understand that you want them to do it now because you're going to be, um, you're going to be overwhelmed, right? Like you're going to be, there's going to be too much work uh, when the country opens up. So, so 
typically, and I don't know about Albania, but typically what we are seeing is that most countries are giving people about one week's notice, seven days to, um, to, uh, um, to when they're going to open things up. And so my encouragement to you would be to make sure that you, in your communications with people now, stay, you know, remember that checklist we were talking about, just give them that checklist that says things that they can do, you know, five days before opening, three days before opening, one day before opening, and then the day of opening. And so make sure in that checklist, you give people a clear indication that what they want to do is start renewing their insurance, say seven or five days before the lockdown is lifted. Because on the day of, they already need to have their insurance sorted out and then they just need to go get gas and do their thing, right? So so I think what you wanna do is put it into the plan, but trying to force them to do it now might be tone deaf. Yeah, like it might just be not, the, yeah. Yeah, I think the checklist is the right way to go. Um, and then, um, yeah, so, so then Luann had added this piece about customers that want to work with you in different ways and what to provide. Of course, Harold, anytime. Um, and I think these are really, really good examples. So what I'd love to do is I'd love to dive into the, into the next set of slides, because I think it really speaks to this topic of listening to the customer. Harold raised it really well. Um, and Eglatina raised it really well um anita raised it really well and then there was another one all see like same like you guys are all in the same place so let's talk about how we can structure these customer conversations to accelerate our path to revenue um and i'll give you an example of spring so spring when the lockdown lifted we work with donors and funders and we work with incubators and accelerators to help them support entrepreneurs like you and so we did is we spent a couple of weeks uh, talking to a bunch of customers and um, and what that revealed to us is that people were not looking for incubation and acceleration. What they were actually looking for was survival. So what we call business resilience. And so what that did is it caused us as Spring to shift our focus um, towards um, uh, providing business resilience programming uh, to our partners and our customers. And so in our particular case, we were able to build a whole new funnel, like an entire, based on an, enti an entire new product, which is uh, resilience programs. And so, um, and so we were able to do that quite successfully in a span of about three weeks. So we're gonna talk a bit about how we did that. Um, in rebooting your entire plan, these are the four main categories that we will go through. And um, it's important to note that the next couple of webinars will focus on sales and marketing, ops and team and finance and funding. So today, if we go to the next slide, um, what we're gonna do, and we've been talking through some questions already, which is great, so we'll just pop to this one. What we're gonna do now is we're just gonna focus the rest of our time on this conversation we've been having, which is customers. And so, so you have already been talking about these. And so, for example, um, what I would say is that uh, I'm just going back through the uh, chat chain. Um, let me see here. Sorry, I want to make sure that I get the name right. Um, Olsi. Yeah, so Olsi, you made this comment where you said, hey, people now are not needing some of the products. And so this is a great opportunity to then go talk to those customers and say hey so i you know i you know this is a product that i buy and you know how do you feel about it right now and so customers are like yeah i don't need it or i don't want it or you know but the goal is to get them talking um that i think would really um i think that would really help uh you to know this kind of response and so luann um, you went through a process of talking to, did you talk to existing customers or prospective customers or both? Both. Um, I first started off with the customers that have been kind of most uh, frequent in our pipeline in terms of just, you know, your high value customers first and asking them what they need. And then what, interestingly, what has happened is that as I was going through talking to these customers that were existing, it opened up another funnel to potential new ones. And the reason why is because 
if you talk to one customer, they say, oh, someone else has a very similar issue to what I'm having. Can we talk to them as well? And that's how it's opened it up actually across Calgary and Toronto now because um, what I'm finding is a lot of similar issues in terms of, say, women's careers and pivoting has happened across the board. And so not only was it my potential or my existing customers, it's opened it up to their networks and their you know, they've now become potential customers that I didn't know existed before. So. Yeah. Um, and so thank you very much for mentioning that because at Spring, we've also done the same thing. So we actually did a combination of um, existing and new. And, and uh, Riata, you, you also shared this uh, where you had talked to existing and new. And so Olsi, I would actually encourage you to do the same thing because you're an FMCG leveraging your social network community like facebook instagram with your corporate profiles if you have them i'm assuming you do um but that's a great place to start and if you have email addresses of customers um then i would encourage you to talk to them as well now as fmcg you can talk to the end customer but you can also talk to the retailer and so try and speak to both so for the retailer, find out like, hey, listen, if my product's not selling, what is selling? How can I help? Are you seeing that people are buying smaller packaging? Are they buying different products? What are they buying? How, you know, so get into that process and the mindset is, how's it going? How can I help? What do you need? Right? Like those are the kind of questions that we're getting into. Um, Anita, you asked a question about a, a checklist sample that you can share. Um, and so, Anita, my encouragement to you, and you can do this in chat, um, or if you want, you can send uh, Luann and I uh, a LinkedIn, like offline, you can send us a, a LinkedIn post as well. Tell us what you would like to use the checklist for, for what customer and what product. So tell us who is it for, like what is the purpose of the checklist, who is it for, and then what is your product or service? And then and then what uh, Lewin and I can do is we can actually make recommendations on how you would structure a checklist template based on that. Um, so Luann, I don't know if you happen to have our LinkedIn uh, links handy somewhere, but if you do, um, that would be amazing. And so we'll just pop those in a chat now. And so while you're doing that, um, Errol says, in my blog, I open a page to help draw, uh, sorry, <laughs> can't even speak right now. I need more caffeine. Um, I open a page to help drivers how to fulfill the request and get permission to move by car. I'm trying to stay close to them. So Errol, first, great, great, great initiative um, on your blog. Can I make a recommendation? I would recommend that you actually create a video as well. So Errol, I would recommend that you create a video that you can post in, say, Facebook and you can link it to your blog, but in that video, what you can do is you can say, hi, my name is Errol and I'm an insurance person. This is what's happening right now for insurance. Let me tell you the steps by which you can, you know, you can get permission to, to drive around. Let me give you my checklist for what you need to do before the lockdown is lifted because videos are very easily shareable and social. Um, and so I would definitely recommend that you do that. Um, and so I think that would be amazing. Um, Olsi, publicity campaign on social media. Um, yeah, yeah, great, great. And, and publicity campaign, one thing that I would encourage for everyone around publicity campaigns is what people are looking for is they're looking for two things, I think. And then Luann would love your take on this. One is people are looking for people to help. Right. So anytime in the, in a publicity campaign or in a social media campaign where you can actually share something that helps other people, they will really value that a lot. And that will increase your brand value. Um, I think we'll also bring a lot of good feedback. Um, and then the second encouragement that I would have. So one is give them something that helps them. So some piece of information or advice or checklist we talked about. And then the second one that I would encourage is that you consider um, uh, curating for them. So Errol is actually doing a really good example of this where Errol is saying, you know what, 
There's a lot of information out there, but what I'm doing is I'm going to curate that and I'm going to tell you exactly how to be able to drive around right now if you need to. And I'm also going to give you the checklist for how to get started when the lockdown is lifted. So what Errol is doing is curating or taking all this kind of crazy information that's out there and turning into something that is easily digestible by people. And I think that that is a really good example. So Luann, those are two things that I think about and would love to just get your perspective as well. Yeah, I would absolutely echo uh, those two points. Um, you know, people are looking to you as a product expert or look, they're looking to, s to find someone to trust about their information. And um, what I found, you know, I'm supposed to be getting married in August. Um, and so a lot of vendors, what they've been doing because photographers, um, all those kind of different vendors haven't been able to go and meet people in person. What a lot of the good ones have been doing have been creating blogs and other types of publicity and content about how to deal with certain things and what that has you know allowed them to do is become the experts in their voice and so if you're a photographer for example i read a great blog from one of them she can't operate right now but what she has done is kind of compiled everything to do with her vendors her relationships what to do during this time for your wedding and what she has effectively become is kind of an expert in her field so i think her traction i think when i was speaking with her her blog went from probably a thousand people to 15,000 people. And I, I it might be skewing those numbers a little bit, but it was an exponential growth because of the fact that people are looking for guidance and looking for expertise right now. And they wanna have a voice that they can trust amid all this noise. And so if you can be that voice and people are the, you're the go-to person for insurance, that puts you in a much better position later when everything opens up as well, because they've trusted you to get them through this kind of difficult time, right? So uh, yeah, I, I think uh, curating, being a product expert, and you know, just keeping that communication up is are the two things in terms of publicity. I think. Yeah, yeah, I think I think building trust is so valuable. I think that's that's great. Um, everyone, I did just put into chat um, that the two tools that we have been using at Spring to record videos to post up into social, one is Zoom, uh, because the Zoom Zoom does have a record feature. Um, but the other product, and the name is very close, but is Loom. And so Loom is actually great for short videos. And it's also a way for you to create a video where you might be sharing your screen and you just want to have a little kind of like, you know, kind of circle with your face on the, uh, you know, in the corner. And so, yeah, Erickens agrees. Loom is awesome. I would really encourage you guys to take a look at those and use those as, as sharing opportunities. Um, and I think that those are, are good um, scenarios. So, so, so I think that's kind of step one is to just discovering what's changed for people and how they're adapting. And so if we go to the next slide, um, then what we do is we just kind of move on to the next uh, kind of component of this is just make sure that as much as possible, you're trying to talk to at least 35 people and the reason we talk about 35 is it's not a random number. 35 is statistically significant. And so what I mean by that is once you talk to 35 or more people, anything more than 35 is representative of your entire audience. And so anything less than 35 it may not actually represent your customer base. It may not represent your um, audience. And so it's just important to note that if you want to know that what you are about to change or do is right, you just need to make sure you talk to at least 35 people to make sure that you have covered sort of the full uh, spectrum of, of possible responses. And so, so that's kind of my, our encouragement there. So if we just pop to the next slide, um on the next slide uh we then the other key piece is that we have to build a script and so i think i can't remember if it was riata or anita at the very beginning of this where you talked about existing and new um customers and you spoke to both and so one way that you look for patterns in the feedback is you say well these people are existing and these people are new customers and so that's a way to create 
separation and what we call pattern recognition. Yeah, yes, both of you, exactly, yeah. Um, and so I have to say, both of you guys are, are definitely doing a great, great job of responding, by the way, knowing not only your responses now, but in the past webinars. Um, but what I would recommend and, and what Luann and I recommend is create a script so that you ask the same questions of every customer so you can actually more easily see the patterns. And the other piece that I would recommend is to make sure that you actually collect uh, demographic data. And so demographic data is age range, income range, um, location where they live, um, uh, education level, um, if it's a business, then we're talking about uh, role or decision criteria. Um, so these would be other things that we would collect in a business to business setting. But the reason we collect that information is because things like how are you responding to the crisis? How can I help? These are what we call subjective questions. The answers can vary and sometimes it's hard to see the patterns. So what we do is we collect demographic data because demographic data helps us to see the patterns. So for example, perhaps in your customer base, women consumers are responding differently than men. Married consumers are responding differently than single. Uh, people who live in the city are responding differently than people who live in the country, right? Um, younger, older, doesn't matter. Um, the important part is that that's what we're trying to do is, is to collect the patterns in the data. So what we want to do is build that script and, and make it a conversation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Make some correlations um, and see what the patterns are. Um, and so what's been interesting at spring, remember I was saying we have had many, many conversations with partners, is that we see in our data, we have seen a separate response from donors and funders than from governments. So governments are responding in different ways than donors and funders. But if I wasn't collecting the fact that one is a donor and one is a, a government, then I wouldn't see that. So I need to know where they are. And interestingly enough, we are also seeing a difference between federal governments and city governments. And so it's interesting for us, like, Collecting that demographic data has been very important for us to know how to respond um, in the market. And Luann, I don't know if you've been collecting some demographic data in your mix and, and what that might be telling you or not telling you right now. Yeah, um, my demographic data has been more on income levels because it's kind of our focus group in the beginning was um, career driven female professionals. And so it was very much income driven. And then as we've had these conversations, it's been kind of expanded more into having, you know, you have female professionals, but then you have people that are outside of that scope. So um, to your point about collecting and getting that demographic data so that you can respond differently, um, you know, there's some women that can purchase and then some that can't. And a lot of it had to do with where they are in terms of income level or where they are in terms of career. And that's, that's definitely, um, you know, collecting that demographic data allows me to see that pattern throughout those conversations. So for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's great. Thank you for that. So if we move on, um, oh, there's a question that was just asked any specific reason why that is different. And Luann, that might have been referencing what you were sharing. Uh, Anita, sorry, can you elaborate? Um, yeah. I'm not sure if it that had to do with mine or what you meant? Yeah, so Anita, if you can just clarify uh, which topic you're asking any specific reason, just to make sure that Luann and I are responding correctly to your question. Mm -hmm. It'd be great if you can do that. Oh, okay. Um, and so Anita, you're referring to why governments and donors and funders are responding in different ways? Yeah, okay, great. So, Anita, what we have found, interestingly enough, is that donors and funders, um, and EU for Innovate, by the way, I think is a very good example of this. Um, donors and funders 
because of their structure and because of their mandate, sometimes they can be a little bit more bold and they can also be a little bit more uh, visionary in their response uh, to what's happening in the market. And so, so um, because they're not a part of like an elected, like they're not elected officials, um, they can actually be a little bit more bold, a little bit more aggressive, and they can also pilot things so they can test ideas. What we have found with government is that government, because they're elected officials, they're more risk averse and they are more hesitant to try something new. So it's taking them longer to make a decision. Now, within the span of government, federal government, more risk averse, slower to move. Per, uh, municipal government, so city governments are not, they're, they're, they're able to be a little bit quicker and a little bit more nimble. So even though the federal governments have more budget, the municipal governments are faster to move. So, so that's actually, in our case, that's our, um, that's our assessment is that donors and funders can be a little bit more aggressive. They can be a little bit more bold, a little bit more visionary. I think what I've seen EU for innovation doing has, is a really good example of this. Um, and then separately, um, the difference between federal and, and, and local governments. So great, great question. Yeah. Great. So we'll move on to the next slide. Um, and uh, in this next slide, what not to do. So it is important to note um, that we don't want to make promises, right? Like, so if we're talking to somebody and they want a new product, so let's say, for example, Luann, in your case, <clears throat> somebody said to you, hey, listen, I don't want to buy a suit, but I want to buy jewelry. You know, you would not want to make a promise to deliver that until you actually did your homework and found out if it made sense, right? Yeah. So, um, so we also don't want to lead them to an answer. We don't want to, we don't want to 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 make them say that our product is the right thing. What we want to do is get them to talk about problems and challenges, and then have them speak into it. And if you are talking about a new product try not to talk about pricing up front until you clearly know that they're interested right save pricing for later because pricing can if they don't understand the value and if they don't really care then it's going to throw your data off so those are just a couple of tips and then if we move on to the next point um the important part is to map the changes and so in our particular case at spring we actually uh, used a spreadsheet um, so just really kept it super easy. Just, you know, here's the organization, where are they based? Um, what type of organization are they? What kind of conversation are we having? Um, how are they responding to some of the questions? So just kept it really, really straightforward with a spreadsheet. Um, Luann, did you use anything fancy in collecting and gathering the feedback? No, uh, I use Google, Do or, uh, Google Spreadsheet to track everything. And then we do use a CRM, but I think at this point, because everything moves so fluidly right now, a spreadsheet is kind of your best friend. And then as things become more concrete, that's when you kind of look at whether that's a CRM database or whatever database uh, uh, you use. Um, but yeah, spreadsheets, yeah. Yeah, great, great. And Anita and Riata, if you have any, like I don't know if you guys want to share how you guys collected the, the results of the conversations that you had, whether you just wrote it down on a notepad or you put it into a doc or a spreadsheet, but if you guys want to share that, that'd be great. Um, just so other people can see some other examples of how people are doing it. Um, and then, so that's step two. So once we've had those conversations, now we can map the changes. And, and so what we'll do is we'll talk about this business, which is called Flowerist. Um, and Flowerist is a company that sells flower. Um, and so you can see, um, this is just a screenshot for them um and different types of flour that they sell and in their particular case when the lockdown started their concern was yeah so great uh thanks anita in a spreadsheet as well and so so flowers was concerned that people were not going to buy flour that they would have to come up with new product ideas but what was interesting here at least in in canada is that in the lockdown you had a lot of families with children everybody stuck at home 
So we got to do something together. So what did they do? They started baking. And so what actually happened with Flourist was that the, um, the demand actually went up, but it meant a couple of things. One is they had to be able to deliver to people's homes. The second one is that they had to be able to offer greater variety because you can see on the screen, sold out, sold out, sold out. It's very hard to sell a product if everything's sold out. Um, so greater variety was number two. Um, and then number three was starting to find complementary products because the challenge was if I'm buying flour to bake things, but what if I don't have, for example, a cookbook, right? Or I'm run out of recipes or I need a certain tool for the kitchen. So they actually started to expand their product line. So three things, one was home delivery. The second one was expand the product line. The third one was to add complementary products. So that's the three responses. But that was based on them talking to their customers over the first two weeks of the lockdown. Um, yeah. And then, um, Luann, I'm going to get you to, sh to just maybe make some commentary on flowers as well. But before you do that, um, I agree with your comment. Typeform is a great tool for surveys. Um, but it, so it's a great tool, especially when you're sending out to your email list um, or if you want to pop in a, a type form survey into like a Facebook post. Um, those are really great ways to do it. And so I always recommend try to talk to 35 people over the phone or over Zoom um, if you can. And then what you do is you round it out with email and Facebook's or Instagram surveys. Yeah. Any comments on that, Luann? Um yeah, to, to your point about the type form, definitely. So I only put it in there because it's a great tool to amass a bunch, bunch of information through a survey, but it is kind of impersonal and you always want to follow up with email or some personal touch. Um, for Flowers, um, comment on that. I think one of the things that, I think I heard this from you, Keith, or someone else on our spring team, but um, in terms of the delivery, instead of, you know, they had to go from an in brick and mortar store to go and be able to deliver on uh, online. And so I think what I heard from you Keith last time was that they got into their cars and delivered the flower and the products themselves because they didn't have a supply chain or a delivery service up and running yet because they need to pivot so quickly. So that's another kind of form of do what you need to do at bare minimum to go and get your product out there and, and them driving around in their car with a bunch of flour in the back is pretty, I'm um, pretty symbolic of how much they wanted to pivot really quickly. Um, so uh, yeah, Keith, I don't know if that was you or someone else in the spring team who mentioned that, but I thought to bring that up. Yeah, no, that's a great, great example. And um, no, I think that's that's really cool. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna move to the next slide, which uh, to benefit Luann, we will only have this up momentarily because I know it will drive her crazy again. Um, <laughs> and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do another poll. Um, and so my poll for you is um, uh, the question, sorry, is um, are you going to talk to more customers in the next two weeks? So in the next two weeks, will you talk to more customers? And then uh, the, the possible answers would be, no, I've done enough. And then the second one is, how can I get more? And then the third one is, I don't know what to do next. So those would be my three um, alternative answers for that poll. And so the poll is going to pop up here momentarily. And Luann, just let me know if you need to repeat on those. So, okay, so the, the poll is up and it says, um, are you going to talk to more customers in the next two weeks? How can I get more? No, I've done enough. I don't know what to do next. Um, yeah, and so great. So if you guys can pop in. So we've got a couple of votes already on how uh, how can I get more? No, I've done enough. Um, so this is great. Uh, so just keep those comments coming. Um, so I am going to... Uh, you know, and and very clearly, we're we're getting uh, like a lot of a lot of response on how I can get more, and so um, this is a great opportunity, I think, for all of us to support each other on how you can get more. 
And so what I might do is I might actually start off by sharing my own personal experience. Um, and then Luann would love to have you share your experience with uh, suit. Um, and then if, if any of you have tips on how to get more, um, I think that that would be great. Um, so in our particular case, a couple things. We are business to business first, right? We work with entrepreneurs and we also work with um, donors, funders, and governments. And so the first thing that we did is we would put a lot of posts into LinkedIn, talking about what we're doing, talking about the challenges of COVID-19, asking people how they need help. So that was the starting point. Um, and I will say for spring, in the context of business to business, that has been the number one source of more customers to talk to. The second uh, place is we have asked existing customers to introduce us to others. Those are the top two for sure. And then Luann, I'll get you to kind of give some of your experience with Suit. And then I, I noticed we have at least one comment that's been added in, in chat that we'll cover after that. Yeah, um, and probably similar, Rita, about your ethical doubts because it's interesting time to be marketing right now because of the fact that you know you don't want to be insensitive, you don't want to be tone deaf. Hey, here's my product, you go buy it even though you're worried about getting to the next month of rent. And so I've kind of gone back and forth with that conversation as well. And you know, very similar to what he said, it's talking to your customer existing because you already have an existing relationship with them. So it's not as cold as you know finding someone new, hey, I have a product, can you go buy it? It's more of a, hey, I've met you in the past, we have an existing relationship, let's have a conversation. So that's the first step. The second step is has been very much um, networking. Um, so what, what I mean by that is because of the fact that everyone wants to feel like they're part of a bigger group, especially now when you're pretty isolated at home, a lot of people have been a lot more open in terms of having a conversation to build out their networks. And so what I was talking about earlier about these new partnerships that we've come across during this time in Calgary and Toronto now, that has very much been because of the fact that we've had these, you know, honest conversations with our existing clients. And then, um, and then kind of, sorry, it just popped up, Rita. Exactly. I know brands are struggling to cover costs and survive. It's tough to ask them to continue with a marketing campaign. A hundred percent agree. And so uh, I don't know if you've, if you've gone on my website during this web webinar, but quite honestly, we haven't posted a blog since the beginning of the year. And the reason why is because, I, we've been having a lot of background conversations directly with our customers because we've been shying away with upfront marketing because of this kind of sensitivity. Um, so these networks that have come about is because of the fact that we've had these background conversations, email, phone calls, Zooms, and all these kind of masterminds and new product offerings that we're starting to test out have been in the background with people that are willing to jump in with us. And so I know that that sounds kind of convoluted because of the fact that you want to go out there and make revenue but sometimes it's just not the right time and if you can afford to kind of take a step back wait it out a little bit and build a little bit more trust before you start asking for people to you know take out their wallets and pay for a product I think you're better off you know later on when when people are willing to do that so yeah I, I think I think everyone in this this group has probably struggled a little bit about the tone and the marketing and so I think you know my my top two are have the conversations offline and directly. And then the second being that, you know, be a little bit patient um, when asking for, you know, them to open up their wallet. Yeah, I'm just uh, quickly brainstorming. So uh, I actually come from a, uh, an agency background uh, prior to uh, spring and, um, and so, um, and I, so therefore I, I've been in the agency space and I also uh, know several people who are in the agency space right now. So a couple things that I would say is first, I agree with Luann about having honest, authentic conversations with people. How are they struggling? What do they really need right now? Um, and so one thing to consider is start by offering free online value via webinars. Um, and, and so you, you mentioned here free marketing, but my comment to you is don't offer free marketing, offer free like uh, uh, lessons learned, tips and tricks, strategies that they can use via webinars. Don't offer what you, what you do for free, 
right? Um, and then the second thing is, instead of saying, hey, listen, I know you can't afford my full package, but what we'll do is we'll offer this lower cost training, right? Um, so what we'll do is we'll do group training and it'll cost you a lot less, but the benefit for you is in doing it a group, you can actually earn enough to make, make it make sense. Um, because it's marketing, I have seen some people um, offer some success fee based approaches. So I won't charge you anything up front. Um, but if it is successful and if we're able to help you grow your revenue, then we can get paid through that success. Um, and then the other one is some people might just want to pay you as an individual to coach them, right? So be available for me on call that if I have it, if I need advice that I can pay you by the hour to do that, right? Um, so, so structuring services in different ways. And then the last thing that I would say is who can you approach right now where their industry is recession proof, right? Where, for example, they're actually selling more now than ever before. So have you considered going to healthcare companies, medical companies, uh, food-based businesses where it's necessity food? Um, like go to the people that are actually selling that. Yeah. So cosmetics, interestingly enough, are a pretty good example. You know what are, what are also two really great examples? Wine and chocolate, mm -hmm. right? Because in every recession, the sales of wine and chocolate go up, but it's competitive. So maybe consider going after these industries, but I would encourage healthcare, healthcare, health tech, medical, medical tech. Um, I would uh, look at uh, chocolate. I would look at wine, especially anybody who is uh, delivering the products into Albania, like new brands that are getting established uh, would be really, really good examples. So just keep that brainstorming coming. Um, and, and I would encourage um, if you get stuck, to also share it with some peers that you have and then you know please do reach out to Luann and I at any time and we'd be happy to help um so great great sharing thank you for that um so Errol thank you for mentioning this you say hey I'm going to plan a zoom event on April 30th which is just a couple of days away two days away with insurance tips so my comment to you is make sure that the topic is relevant for right now so I will give an example, how to save money on insurance during a recession, right? Or how to, uh, um, how to get more out of your car when you can't afford to buy a new one, right? So, so, so the comment is not about like, hey, like I'm thinking about insurance today as a consumer. It's not about that. It's like, help me save money help me stretch my dollar, right? Help me make everything last longer. And so you know what, what I'm talking about. And, and so, so explore those topics, you know, test them when you're in that webinar on Thursday. And I think it's a, it's a great, great way for you to kind of talk to people in very honest ways about what's happening. Um, cool. Um, so why don't we uh, move towards close because we only have a couple minutes left. But I do want to touch on a couple of things. First, again, talk to at least 35 people. Look for the patterns in the demographic data. If you don't know how to structure your questionnaire, send Luann and, and I or Luann or I a LinkedIn note and we can kind of give you some feedback to help you through it. Um, and then the next thing, if we go to the next slide, is that, um, uh, yeah, so just make sure that you actually describe your customer. So make this a, an actual task that you do where you say, with these changes, who are my customers, existing and or new, and describe them. What are their demographics? What do they need? Why are they buying? How are they buying? This will help you when you structure that to then make a plan for how to deliver. And this description is what we call a customer persona. And when we have more than one, to Eglantina's uh, point, we then have segmentation. So maybe we have two or three uh, customer segments. Um, in, the, in the case of um, uh, the FMCG example earlier, right, one segment is the consumer and another segment is the retailer. 
And so describing both and making sure that you, you have them described, that leads us to our next slide. Once we have those descriptions in place, then what we can do is we can map our customer plan. So is the product for this customer the same? Do I need a new one or do I augment and create new, new alternatives like Luann has done with Suit? Um, how do I get to them? How do I price them? And when you start to create the answers to this quote, these questions, then you will have a customer plan per segment. Now you're on the path, right? So if we, if we flip to the next slide, so what have we done? In the prior webinar, uh, last week we talked about our numbers. So now we've built, now we're building our customer plan. So we know how much money we have, we know our runway, and then what we do is we build this customer plan and so what we're gonna do in the next couple of webinars is we're gonna focus on how we get to them through sales and marketing and community. Um, and also, yeah, we want analysis and analysis is, can just be done in a spreadsheet. We do not need to do anything fancy, um, but it's a really, really good starting point. So, so great, great comment and I agree. Um, if at any point in time you are stuck please do ask, right? Reach out to Luann, reach out to myself, reach out to Erkins that's, who is on this uh, webinar as well. Um, and, and just make sure that you're kind of asking those questions. Um, and so what I would encourage is that for next week's session, we're gonna focus specifically on rebooting the sales plan. So digging deeper on that topic, uh, we'll have another guest who will come in and join us on that. Then we'll do reboot marketing. Then we'll do reboot community. So we're really gonna make sure that you guys are building strong plans that will help you really grow. Um, yeah, you know, Eglantina, I think that's a really good point. Like customers can even become your partners. Uh, and and now is the time to to reshape that, that, that relationship. So really, really great point. Um, then we're gonna talk about raising money in a recession um, and, and digging in on funding uh, a little bit further. And then June 2nd, we're actually gonna talk the other side of the table, which is investing in uncertain times. And so we're really excited for those. Um, and then we'll just move to the, I think what might be the last slide, um, more or less. Um, yeah, and so just again, one more time, I just wanna thank you for innovation for, for this opportunity to do this. You guys have been amazing on this session. So many fantastic comments and questions and ideas. Um, Luann, any parting comments for the group? No, this is a great session. I realize we're three minutes over time. So um, any further questions, just like he said, connect with us on LinkedIn. We're more than happy to help in any way we can. So very nice meeting all of you. Yeah, so fantastic. So if you haven't already, connect up with Luann and I um, in LinkedIn. Um, and Luann, you can pop in our LinkedIn uh, links one more time in, in chat. Um, but do connect with us if you haven't already. Um, keep the questions coming. Um, and then Anita, um, the previous sessions, um, EU for Innovation, uh, we'll send out the this example recording and we can also send out the prior ones at the same time um, So Anita will make sure that you have those and Ericans will help to make sure that we do that uh, Which is great um, And then the only other thing that I would say is when you receive the recording of this session um, and you want to uh, If there's a topic that you don't think we're covering in an upcoming webinar just send Ericans um, or EU for innovation a note saying it would be great if we had a webinar on a specific topic um, because then maybe we can either switch the topics around or we can add it in. So uh, really appreciate everybody taking the time. Luann, amazing. Thank you very much for being a part of this. Thank you, everyone. Awesome. Okay, thanks, everybody, and uh, have an enjoyable evening, and we will talk again next week. We'll see you then.